This is MS Office Hours. Today is April 4th, 2019. And with us today, we have Glenn Martin and some of his folks from the University of Texas Austin. They're going to talk to us about transitioning from directly assigned licenses to inherited licenses or group-based licensing. Take it away, Glenn. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Preston said, uh, Glenn Martin with the uh, email team here at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. We were having a chat earlier in the day and the topic of group-based licensing had come up and I, we discussed a little bit our experiences and Preston suggested that I share it with you guys since, you know, a lot of you are going through the same thing. Hopefully you can avoid some of the pitfalls that we ran into. Uh, and now, the biggest difficulty we ran into, obviously, is the transition from direct licensing to group-based licensing. Uh, th there's an important intermediate step that you really have to take to successfully pull that off. And once you get past that step, it all gets very easy. And that is in, in doing your initial group-based license assignments, go ahead and match what is directly licensed to license them for the same thing and make sure there are no conflicts. Conflicts are what will eat you alive. Uh, but if, if you initially start off your group licensing doing exactly what they already have licensed, then let it settle for a while, make sure you have no conflicts, then rip out the direct licensing. And after that, you can tweak the group membership and what services are and licenses are activated on the group to your heart's content. Um, if you fail to do this, you will run into problems. Uh, another lesson learned from this is that uh, for services that are prone to introducing conflicts, specifically Exchange and SharePoint, uh, where you might have some a mixture of exchange plan one and exchange plan two, SharePoint plan one, SharePoint plan two. Those are what are going to cause you uh, issues. What we did is we segmented out those problematic services into their own licensing groups. So we have a group that gives our base licenses that we give to all of our FAC staff and uh, then a separate group specifically for SharePoint Online, a specific one, separate one specifically for Exchange Online. That way, if say we are assigning, if the user is using a SKU that has an Exchange Plan 1 and SharePoint Plan 1 license, but they also have a SKU assigned to them that has Project Online Plan 2, such as uh, 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 Project Online, which has a, a SharePoint Online Plan 2 uh, service enabled, that will create a service. So in that case, we do not add them to the, the SKU that has the Plan 1 SharePoint. We put them in everything else and then leave the, the licensing for the SharePoint to the, uh, to the uh, Project Pro SKU. Uh, by doing that segmentation, it makes it much easier to spot and avoid conflicts and resolving those licensing conflicts can be a pain. Uh, as was mentioned earlier in the uh, chat, someone was asking about uh, whether it was on the roadmap to have PowerShell triggered reevaluation of group based licensing and I'll let leave that to Preston since I don't have any insight into that. Right now, you have to go into the Azure uh, portal and look for the license conflicts. Once you've resolved them, hit the button to tell it to reevaluate before it will refresh and uh, try again to see if you've actually resolved whatever conflicts you've run into. But uh, that can so, be a very tedious process. <laughs> so one of the things that I want to talk about is specifically around that, Glenn, which is when you're running uh, the, the what I call phase one, which is going from the direct applied licenses to I'm using an interim group where I'm applying mm -hmm. the exact same license. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden it's going through and it hits somebody who has SharePoint plan two because they also happen to be using project. And it's going to stop processing right there and there's this magic button you can push that will just remove all of their office 365 licenses and let you run this thing again do you advise people to do that did you 
So if you want, uh, we, we tried to resolve the underlying issues and then just said the did the whole reevaluation. Actually, uh, yeah. The problem is if you push that button, it will take any of their custom settings like Exchange, Forwarders, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. blow all of that away. And then when you add the new license, that didn't just magically come yeah, back. You have to then manually basis, go find that and reapply. Yeah. Whereas I think if you so, take the time yeah, to go through and do the segmentation first to right say, here. these are my standard students, these are my students with Project Online, and set those as two different groups, right? And run those as, as separate processes. Now you can get through that better. In other words, when you see somebody air it out, don't just strip their licenses. Go back into the admin center, apply the quote standard license or move them out of the current group being processed so that you don't just strip their licenses and lose settings, right? Hey, hey, hey Preston, this is uh, Chase Morledge. I'm also um, uh, Glenn's coworker. Uh, I can yep. speak to this a little bit. Um, yeah, so basically when we first um, uh, tried to move people over to group-based licensing, we thought we could skip that first step you know we thought we were smarter than the documentation everybody and, does uh, yeah uh so basically what we what we tried to do you know we had that those direct assignments we had these this particular population this test group uh that we 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 started this process with um they had exchange plan one under the uh, a1 licensing and uh we were going to move them kick them up all the way to uh, a5 which has exchange plan two so basically what uh, we thought we could do was just, oh, we'll just throw them in these group, this this uh, A5 licensing group and they'll get that, uh, they'll get an initial conflict, right? But then we'll just revoke their licenses and then uh, reevaluate uh, and, you know, with that magic button in Azure AD and that will, you know, reassign all the license, licenses properly. And that did, you know, obviously reassign, after we revoked, you know, their individual assignments that did um, resign licenses properly, but there was that overlap period uh, after the um, the direct licenses have been uh, after we we remove those and then click that reevaluate button. There's like a period, and uh, yeah, stuff uh, properties associated with their mailbox kind of dropped off, and there was a time where they weren't licensed. Licensed, so yeah, not the way to go. And at UTMB, we can affirm that that definitely is the case because we got bit by that ourselves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what you know? What did you guys do? Did you just stop at that point, go back and and do kind of an interim group, or how do you come back? So for that particular issue, uh, since we knew uh, who was affected, basically because they're sitting right there in that group, right? Uh, what we had to do was look at. Uh, we grabbed all those users and used PowerShell to get message trace. And we piped message trace details. We looked for um, forwarding events, basically. And then we grabbed their old email address that was being forwarded. Uh, it, things were being forwarded to uh, just you know using the get message trace uh, details logs. And then we had to, you know, we just scripted that back in and, uh, you know, set XO mailbox and we were able to recover that information but um yeah after that we we changed our our approach and we we did it the right way and uh yeah we just started um uh licensing doing one for one basically and uh with the individual inherited licenses and if there were any uh license conflicts that came up uh, in the future or, or during that that time uh we resolved those conflicts before removing the uh, direct assignment. Is there, can you talk to what exchange properties were lost? Somebody had asked, I know you'd mentioned forwarding, what else? Uh, uh, the only, so forwarding address and forwarding SMTP address, that was the only thing that we noticed, but you know, it's kind of hard to know what is gone, right? Uh, I believe inbox rules were still kept, um, folders were still kept, uh, I don't remember if auto replies were affected or not. We never really found documentation on this meeting. Yeah. What about delegation rights? If someone had delegate rights on someone else's mailbox, were those kept or lost? I I can't speak to that. Not it's certain. just kind of hard to know. But yeah, our our the um our the population that was affected by this, since it was kind of like a test group, right? It was not not too many people. Uh, 
So we don't have uh, many points of data to find out what exactly was lost. Were any of the users voice users? PSTN? No, you guys aren't using PSTN. We're not using that. Uh, okay. We have a completely separate voice solution, a uh, voice okay. solution. Thanks. But here's what I would say, right? And Chase and, and Glenn, keep me honest here, uh, or the guys at UTMB, anybody. As long as you follow the two-phased approach, like I sent the links to in the email, or like is explained in the documentation that if those links point to, that that doesn't happen, right? If we first create an interim group where we match their existing licenses identical, then we strip away the direct a license, direct assign licenses. Then we there is a process to deal with group based license to group based license transition uh, for conflicting plans, right? So then you could step them up to A5 in your case, going from GBL to GBL, right? And nobody lost anything. Well, actually, that's, that's that actually is something I want to ask about because we just did the uh, A A1 to A5 and we ended up with. 2400 ghost mailboxes we ended up with all kinds of licensing issues um so and what we had done and i think we i didn't know about this doc at the time but my belief was what caused it was how we did it we have we have groups so we have staff students we have things carved out different ways and these groups uh one of them in particular has 12,000 people in it so it's a large group to process we wanted to go from a one day five on that group. So we thought the proper thing to do was pop the license, put the new a five license on and hit reprocess. And that I think is where it happened. It went ugly. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely not the right yeah. way to do it. It seems like it, right? I mean, that is like a common sense thing. Why wouldn't that be it, Michael? But yeah, so yeah. now in hindsight, what we probably should have done was created a mirror of each of those groups, license A1, license A5, match them up, do what we needed to do, and then pop the, and this was group to group, so this was not direct to group. So just to be clear for everybody else, group to group will do this same process. That's so right. that's probably what we should have done, but we didn't know that at the time. And uh, now the ghost mailbox thing, that's something Microsoft still has not yet come back and said is even physically possible, but we've had it happen very often. Um, and in this case was the worst batch yet um, where they end up there and on the on premise users who are still on premise mailboxes end up with an 0365 mailbox at the same time, even though Dersync is up to date, the attributes are up to date, everything's We've encountered good. that. Not not yeah, related nope. to this, but yeah. <laughs> right, and the only thing that I can suppose at this moment is when, in most cases, it's been license trigger. We've moved somebody, we've changed some licensing, and I think what happens when it goes to evaluate that, oh, here's a user, here's a license change, I, I need to find out if they have a mailbox. Oh, I didn't get a response back fast enough from AD, perhaps Azure AD, that's saying they, that already. They see the same and it goes away as exchange attributes, so it assumes it yeah. should provision a mailbox, so even though they already have one on prep. Both. Yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, I'll add the one thing that we ran across here, and what we ended up doing was I took a complete license group. So if it was A1 students, brought them everybody from a direct A1 student to a group base A1 student and did that for faculty and all that. So basically it was just, you know, the major groups based off the licenses that were currently direct assigned. <clears throat> and the scripts that are on the page for conversion, I mean, it helps with all that. It checks for licenses to make sure they match all that before it will remove any user from a direct base license. Once they were in groups, we then split it to, based off of our classifications, if we knew licensing was gonna be changing for those people moving forward into groups with the, the same license assigned. And then once we were ready to move into A5, it was a new group that we were populating from on-prem at that point, populated those groups, added the licensing to it, wait for it to go into a conflicting state. Once they're all in a conflicting state, then remove the users from, or the license from the other group. So that's extremely important. And that is in the documentation, is you wait for that conflict to occur, then yeah. you remove the old one. Yeah, because we followed that and we had zero data loss. 
I mean, no problems with anything. Uh, initially, with our test group, we kind of did the same thing and said, well, maybe we can skip this and do this. And yeah, no. You have to follow that document exact. And if you do that with the scripts that are provided, I mean, granted, you have to do some modifications to, to really make it work for your environment. But it work, those work like a champ. Yeah, this is Chase Morledge again. Yeah, that's the right way to go about it. Uh, I think really what I've found uh, from from this process is if you ever have to, or if you find a need to go in and, and, and have to trigger a uh, license re-evaluation re-eval- manually, you're probably doing it wrong. Because when you move, yeah, from group to group uh, with the inher- inherited licensing, uh, all the reevaluation will be done automatically uh, after the user is in that conflicting state. Just a question on that one thinking, and, and I would like to ask that. Um, so we've done it like when we made that change. Now, admittedly, we now know we probably could have done it slightly differently. Um, but in that point, we were doing it during a change window. So, you know, 12,000 people, I wanted it to start that a process of immediately and did it with a reprocess. What you're saying is if we had done this correctly, but still it would have been a matter of patience. Just let it settle and then at a different time pull people out of the first group and let it settle and let it do it all on its own its own way and not do the manual. Correct. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean for a single person doing something manually it makes sense that we could do that, but for the large group just let the back end processes do what they need to do. Okay. Right. I mean, the the first couple steps you can actually do in the middle of the day, and no one will ever notice when you're going from direct to group base using the scripts because it won't remove the direct licensing until it notices both licenses actually match and have the the same SKUs and everything assigned to them. So you can technically you can do this without interrupting anyone anyone for service. I understand doing it in a maintenance window, but at the same time. You know, if you follow that document, you can do it in the middle of the day and most people won't notice a difference. The only thing we technically did in the maintenance window was moving them from um, A1 to A5. And we just set that off to go like at midnight and by 6 a.m. they were done. And we were, I was doing that for 30,000 users. And it was, you know, in the middle of the night, just kick it off and it was done by the time I went in in the morning. So, and, and Brian Spence, he was the first one that called this to my attention, and <laughs> where I realized, hey, you got to follow this license exactly. So I know he went through the fire here as well. Um, so I appreciated that. But hopefully, this has been helpful. Uh, I appreciate all you guys coming on, especially Glenn and Chase, who I cornered literally just this morning and said, hey, by the way, why don't you guys come talk to everybody about it? Because I think these stories of what you guys really had to deal with and and the way that that you went through and tried to parse the logs to figure out how to do your best to put some of the stuff back uh, is is harrowing. And it's also great for everyone to realize they don't want to do that. Nobody on this call wants to do what you guys did. It's much better to just follow the follow these directions and when in doubt, come back to this group and ask either in teams or here on this call and come ask. Don't just shotgun this and part of what allowed us to survive is that we tested it on a small group of users first test 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 it's really important for sure and uh one thing uh you might want to do at the end of uh if you've moved all your your licensing to group based i recommend creating two uh if you have access to cloud app security i recommend recommend creating two alerts uh one that'll notify you if there's any license modifications to a group and another one that will notify you if uh, maybe you have another admin who's, who's not completely up to date on the group licensing process and they start going in and individually uh, assigning licenses to users. Uh, I recommend you creating those two alerts. That's a great idea. Thank you. That's a good suggestion. And so I think Mark asked a question that's good too. How did everyone handle the transition? So we update licenses all the time. Accounts are created 24 seven. Did you all have to create a moratorium on license changes to allow GBL to take over? I think most people actually honestly do this in the middle of the day and, and aren't doing that, but you guys tell me. No, we didn't wait for a maintenance window or anything like that. 
I'll take that one. Um, so we're a hospital 24 seven and I did mine all over two weeks during the day. Um, as Preston knows, I'm pretty much by myself. So we have about 8,300 users. We moved from A1 to A5 and uh, the very first thing, you know, that <coughs> command you were talking about for alerting, that was great. What I did is I changed our t entire provisioning process first. So all new users got automatically provisioned to A5 group-based licensing, and then I started moving the old users. That way I didn't have a moratorium on licensing. Nobody had to be left in the old stuff while I was moving people and not realize that somebody didn't get moved. And it was great in, in that aspect because we actually did licensing cleanup at the same time. So uh we did scripts on people that hey you haven't logged in in 90 days okay we need to find out if you're really a physician still that's similar to what we went through actually because we had just deployed some new mailbox provisioning and management tools and right out of the gate we were using group-based licensing for any new mailboxes so then we just had to go back and back convert everybody else so I want to see if I can summarize some things real quick and let you guys, all of you have been through this, correct me where I'm wrong. So, and uh, Mark, I'm uh, Damascus, I'm going to encourage you to come off mute too after this. You've got a lot of great questions that are in there. I'm sure I didn't, I, I, we didn't address all of them, but a uh, few things to think about. Number one, you cannot use Office 365 groups. You can use Azure Active Directory security, mail enabled security groups, or you can use synced Active Directory mail enabled security groups, um, but you cannot use those Office 365 groups for GBL. Um, and the groups you're going to need at a minimum are going to be, you're going to need duplicates of every one of these groups and you're going to want to declare groups based upon your class of users. Uh, best to start at your highest class of consistency. So if all students are supposed to be licensed exactly the same in your institution, you could have two all students groups. One is an interim all students and the other one is the final all students group that you're going to land in. Brian Melisson mentioned at LSU, one of the things that they did was beyond that, had another set of groups that then maybe if you were in a K-12 would be all of your uh, K through eight users and then an, a one that would be your the rest of your student users when you would step them up later. But at a minimum, you need an interim and a final group for each of your user classes. Did I say anything out of turn staying, there? It, as long as you're staying with the same licensing. When you're doing the licensing swap, that's when you're going to need the extra group because you're going to go right. from direct. Well, I say that. OK, so that's because why you we need the went, two groups, right? We went direct to group in Azure AD and then we went to a sync from on prem. So that's why we had to have the multiple groups, right? And then that that brings up uh, the. The other thing that you guys were saying was that uh, you before starting this process, it might be advisable to actually switch your provisioning process to start using the group based licensing so that from the time you start this, anyone new gets added in or provisioned is automatically GPL. That made for a smoother transition. Uh, a few other yeah. things to watch out for. Uh, group based licensing cannot use nested groups. It does not support that and it's in the documentation. Read the documentation. Another thing, uh, we are using synchronized groups through Azure AD Connect. Uh, group synchronization has a 50,000 member limit. So if you're in a large org like we are, uh, for our student licensing groups, we broke them up uh, into based upon the first character of their SAM account name, I believe. So, so we have two buckets for each of our uh, student groups. I thought Thank I thought you. that limit was increased to a hundred thousand. I had not heard that. Uh, I thought it was a hundred hundred thousand was absolute max. They were saying anything over fifty to sixty thousand calls performance issues. Uh, I had not heard about that. Yeah, I, I, I that. would. I would say right now, if you have the ability to break them into fifty thousand or less while doing a transition like this, I would. I would keep it down. My concern is hundred thousand. <laughs> is man. Too too much option for error right there is my concern. So the last thing I would say, I sent some links in the IM window. Uh, 
no, that, that is not an exhaustive list of documentation you need to read to do this. Once you open one of those last two, the phase one, phase two, as I call them, you'll actually see over on the left, there's a whole section called assign licenses, and there's a bunch of documents there. Read those documents before you start. Even if you think this document doesn't apply to me, read the document. Maybe it doesn't apply, but if you run into a problem, you're going to wish you'd read all the docs. There are little things that are just mentioned in passing, like the no support for nested groups. It's easy to miss that. So we'll be here every week. Come back, ask questions. This is a, a major topic. I really appreciate everybody's input on this. This is the way I, I think office hours ought to flow every single week is let's let's get into topics that you guys are are struggling with or need uh, some peer guidance on and let's just keep doing this. So thank you so much to uh, the guys at UT Austin for volunteering to be my guinea pigs today and for everybody else for jumping in. I'm going to stop the recording, but I am going to hang out for a bit and keep answering questions as well as if you guys want to stay on this topic. Yeah. That's perfectly fine. The only other thing I would add Preston to this, as you said, they had to be mail enabled. Technically, they do not. Oh, really? OK. No, they do not need to be mail enabled. But if you're going to A5 and you're going to be using ATP, you want them mail enabled because you will need that later for assigning uh, policies and with ATP. Because originally, yeah, originally all of ours were not mail enabled, and they it works like works like normal. But like I said, once you get into the ATP stuff, some of it is based off of regular AD groups, and other functionality has to be mail enabled, like safe links. Excellent. Thank you. Now I'll stop the recording. Thanks for getting that in there.